Our top story at this hour, U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris officially conceded defeat to her Republican rival Donald Trump in the 2024 presidential election, but vowed not to concede the fight that fueled her campaign. The outcome of this election is not what we wanted, not what we fought for, not what we voted for, but hear me when I say, hear me when I say, the light of America's promise will always burn bright as long as we never give up and as long as we keep fighting. Her supporters at Howard cheered for her as she urged them to accept the result of the election. She also told them that she had dialed declared winner Trump to congratulate him. Earlier today, I spoke with President-elect Trump and congratulated him on his victory. I also told him that we will help him and his team with their transition and that we will engage in a peaceful transfer of power. Harris warned of a dark time but ended her speech calling for optimism and faith. I know many people feel like we are entering a dark time. But for the benefit of us all, I hope that is not the case. But here's the thing, America, if it is, let us fill the sky with the light of a brilliant, brilliant billion of stars. The light, the light of optimism, of faith, of truth, and service. Yeah. H.U. <laughs> and may that work guide us even in the face of setbacks toward the extraordinary promise of the United States of America. Trump won the U.S. presidential election for a second term, handing Harris a defeat in one of the most remarkable comebacks in American electoral history. The Republican won more than half of the U.S. states, including key battlegrounds, Georgia, Pennsylvania, Michigan and Wisconsin, all of which voted Democrat in the last election. That gave him 295 electoral votes as against Harris's 226 so far. Final calls are yet to be made in Arizona and Nevada. And for more on this, we're now being joined live by our VOA correspondent, Steve Herman from Georgia. Steve, thank you so much for joining us. Of course, I want to first start by asking you, what is the mood like on ground in Georgia right now, which happened to be a big win for Trump? Well, that depends whether you're uh, someone who voted for Donald Trump or for somebody who voted for Kamala Harris. There is a, a bit of a, a disbelief among uh, Democrats in this state. Uh, they worked very hard on the ground, did lots of door knocking, and were fairly confident uh, up until uh, Election Day. Uh, for uh, the Donald Trump uh, supporters, the Republicans, of course, uh, they are relieved and uh, joyful and uh, very happy that after setbacks uh, in recent years for Republicans in statewide elections, that Donald Trump was able to capture uh, this uh, key swing state with uh, 16 electoral votes. Uh, absolutely, Steve. I just want to understand going into this. Of course, we know Georgia, it has 16 electoral votes. Trump won by a significant margin. Uh, his vote share was at 50.7%. I just want to understand when it comes to Georgia and many of the swing states, in fact, where do you think the Democrat camp went wrong? Well, uh, that'll be a subject uh, for, for quite a long time. But looking at the uh, exit polling, it's uh, very obvious that uh, young white men uh, who had voted for uh, Joe Biden four years ago 
went with Donald Trump uh, this time around. And also, uh, there are certain other demographics, uh, such as African Americans and uh, older women who uh, underperformed uh, for uh, uh, the Democrats. And uh, the Democratic Party in states like Pennsylvania, for example, more than Georgia, had really pinned their last minute hopes on uh, rallying uh, the Puerto Rican uh, Spanish speaking uh, community to their cause uh, because of the insults that were made about uh, Puerto Rico by a comedian at Donald Trump's Madison Square Garden rally. But uh, they just did not have enough of a turnout uh, to uh, to overcome uh, this um, uh, really surprising support uh, for Donald Trump on Election Day. All right, Steve, do stay on with us. We're also now being joined by Reza Khanzadeh from Washington, D.C., a U.S. political analyst and West Asia analyst. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. Of course, the results are in front of us. It's a win for Donald Trump. Now, you are a West Asia analyst as well. West Asia has been going through a very volatile period. Trump has said that once he is president, had said that once he is president, which he is now, he will end all wars. What's your assessment of that? What does a Trump presidency look like in the years ahead? Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, in regards to the wars that he's referring to, which is the Ukraine war between Ukraine and Russia, and also the genocide in, in Gaza between, between Israel and the Palestinians, um, when it comes to the war in Ukraine first, I do believe he has a, a stronger hand in trying to negotiate a peace deal in that. But of course, his his roadblocks will be NATO and also many of the politicians within his own party, but then also just in Washington, D.C., uh, because most strategists believe that the deal that he might cut with Putin would be to uh, carve out a piece of Ukraine for Russia. Uh, now, if if that were to happen, uh, I believe that would that would be very detrimental on on many different levels, which which goes beyond uh, the time we have on this show. But then now focusing back on the other war or that you know genocide in Gaza, um, what we've seen from Trump in his first four years as president, when he was the forty fifth president of the United States, he had a very close relationship with the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu. And there were a there was a long list of of things he did for the prime minister that essentially gave Israel um, unlimited access and unlimited abilities to do essentially whatever they wanted, particularly in the West Bank. And now that he's a president again, and we know he can't run for a second term because this is his final ter you know term in office, he might actually give. Israel and Benjamin Netanyahu even more freedom to do whatever they want, which seems catastrophic considering what President Joe Biden has essentially allowed Israel to do up to this point, which is a mass atrocity and you know genocide. So it seems like from what we know historically from Trump, things are not gonna be any better at all for the Palestinians. It's, it's, it's gonna look like it's going to get worse. Now, of course, he says he wants to end wars and he wants to, you know, win the Nobel Peace Prize and he wants to be the hero for, for all the people in the Middle East. We'll have to wait and see what happens there because, you know, with Trump, it, you just you just hmm. don't know what you're going to get with him from one day to the next. Because e even at, for, like the example with Iran, in his, in his first four years in office, he had multiple opportunities to actually attack Iran and bomb specific parts of Iran, whether it's the military, you know, bases yeah. or like you know different, you know, different nuclear sites. But he didn't. So it, it's 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 you know quite a gamble to kind of hmm. you know forecast what what a future would look like under a Trump presidency. Uh, right, Mr. Reza. Steve, coming back to you now, this is something that a lot of other analysts that we were speaking to yesterday as well have echoed. And I'm just going to take that point that Mr. Reza has made forward. And I want to see clarity from you here. We did hear many analysts say that under a Trump presidency, support for Israel may only be bolstered further. What's your assessment of this, Steve? Well, uh, as pointed out, uh, Donald Trump has had uh, pretty uh, deep ties uh, to uh, Israel uh, for a number of years. Uh, 
the Adelsons uh, were his, I believe, biggest single uh, contributor, a, a powerful uh, a Jewish family out of Las Vegas whose uh, single issue has seemed to be uh, support for Israel and uh, moving the U.S. Embassy uh, to uh, Jerusalem. Uh, and of course, there were the Abraham Accords uh, uh, that were instituted in the first uh, Trump administration. And uh, I, I think, as was also pointed out by Reza, that uh, Donald Trump really wants to win a Nobel Peace Prize. He's made this very clear. He thought it was unfair uh, that uh, Barack Obama, uh, his uh, predecessor in his, of his first presidency, got one for, as uh, Trump put it, for really doing nothing. And uh, I, I think he is going to uh, uh, try to um, strike uh, uh, some sort of uh, overarching deal that, that were, they were still working on at the, at the end of the uh, first uh, uh, Trump administration. But um, I, I think that, uh, as we have seen in the public statements, that uh, the Israeli prime minister, Benjamin Net Netanyahu, is very uh, uh, happy about uh, Donald Trump coming back to the White House. All right, Mr. Reza, coming back to you now, I'm going to take the same question as I did with Steve. I just want to get your opinion on what you think went wrong with the Democratic camp as uh, we've heard both their policies on global affairs, on the wars. Uh, what's your assessment of that? Yeah, there's there's a lot to unpack there, which which unfortunately we don't have enough time. But I think, I think the short answer um, goes back to, I think, uh, President Obama's, uh, one of his advisors, I think his name is David Axelrod, he, he said it's the economy stupid. Um, mm -hmm. And that's essentially what it came down to. We see uh, a shift in numbers when it comes to white voters, black voters, even even though Harris won uh, you know, the black vote, Trump still gained points on those votes. Uh, so the, you know, the white vote, the black vote, even the Hispanic vote, um, and, then, and, and then of course the Arab Muslim vote. Uh, there were there were all upticks towards Trump, and from almost you know most of them, it was a it was more than fifty percent towards Trump. And speaking to as many people as is, that is possible when it when it comes to this election, almost all of them it came down to the economy. It came down to their their own bank accounts, what's in their pocketbook, how they're able to put food on the table, and how they're able to put gas in their car. Um, and essentially, that's that's what it came down to. Now, you know, Harris's approach was attacking Trump, talking about you know abortion, and talking about uh, moving forward and also uniting, but very very little on substance when it came to the economy. Now, one thing that was in Trump's favor was that we had four years of him, so we had something to look back and compare to. With Harris, we we had nothing. And if you recall, she ran for president in 2020. Uh, against Joe Biden to see who would be on the ticket as, as a Democratic nominee. And she, I, I, I think she barely even made it past the first, you know, like, like the first round of, you know, debates. So she, she was, you know, untested, not, not well experienced. And, and the people around her were more of the same types of people that were there for Clinton when she lost to, to Trump and then were there for Biden. Uh, but, but the difference was between Biden and Harris is that Biden's approach was, look what Trump has done to us. Hmm. But Harris's approach was, look what Trump did. Hmm. She wasn't really looking forward to what can she do to, hmm. to make things any better or any different. She was kind of stuck in this limbo of talking about what Trump used to be like hmm. and then kind of focusing on two or three issues that, at the, at, you know, like if you look at the women vote, Hmm. A lot of them, a vast majority. I think I, I have the numbers here. It's like, you know, fifty, almost fifty percent voted for Trump. Hmm. Now, if their core issue was abortion, and you know, even like like you know, pro-choice, hmm. why did they still vote for Trump? Hmm. I think that goes back again towards just like the like the basic needs of the, you know, like ordinary average person, which is hmm. money having enough money in their bank account to, to feed their children, to you know, pay their mortgage, pay their rent. So I think I think that's what she missed, uh, you know, during this, you know, campaign. Uh, Mr. Khanzadi, you raised some very uh, important points there. And uh, Steve, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, same to you, Mr. Khanzadi. Thank you so much for joining us on a World Beyond World is One.
it's been a pleasure listening to your insights on this. Thank you. For latest news, download the Vion app and subscribe to our YouTube channel.